number one is the top end funnel. Then if we talk about attention to detail, that's where you retain the customers and get the referrals. One, two, three, four. Many thanks, Chris, um, for uh, volunteering to be uh, on our, our latest podcast, Sense of Identity. Um, uh, I, I, I've got a few words in there. What I really, this is about, this is about you and your businesses and you know, what, you, what you've been up to historically. But um, Sense of Identity as a podcast is a map trying to meet the people in the industry that make a difference. From what I've been reading and I understand about you, you've made a lot of difference, done a lot of things. You've got a lot of experience across a, a lot of different areas. But fundamentally, the founder of Mortgage Hut, the Mortgage Hut, with your wife, Nicola. That's and now from what I understand also, your three dogs and three j- children, a better man than me, if I may say so, to be able to just handle that. That's a great place to start. But um, when I was sort of looking into uh, chatting to you, um, it became quite clear, obviously, your uh, the, the Mortgage Hut is, is, is a very important part of what you do but you are spread across an awful lot of other things you know it'd be right to say you're definitely a local entrepreneur in fact what i did find out was that back in 2016 which actually doesn't feel that long ago probably partly because of covid i don't know about you but i have this gap it just disappears from me but you were the regional young entrepreneur entrepreneur of the year as well so lovely accolades to have so listen thanks chris for joining us anyway, i'm chris shrips she trap excuse me chris Shreep, i'm so sorry um, thanks for joining us. It's um, really lovely I'm to have you here. Way don't worry, I've, uh, you, you don't want to hear some of the stuff. I've been <laughs> well, on the surname and the mistake, though, I, I, there's a question I'm going to ask you later on because I did a little bit of digging around there. But I'll come back to you. So I've actually the reason I'm I've got a mental block there is I've been looking into your surname because I was fascinated. But we'll come back to that. We'll come back yeah, to that in a minute. Good, good. <laughs> I might so, learn some stuff myself. <laughs> <laughs> the, I mean, the first thing i mean i've seen some other interviews with you so i'm, I'm hoping we can keep those as equally as interesting because you've, you've you've led a really interesting life apart from the fabulous success with the mortgage chart you, you and nicola have, have, have shared of course you're involved in other things i think hospitality has been a big part of your life customer yeah. services I, I wonder if you could firstly so i don't do all the talking tell us a little bit more about all that because i was just fascinated to hear about all those other things you were up to yeah, I guess I uh, fell into hospitality, really. I uh, I bought a pub for a family member um, who subsequently they actually bought another business, so I ended up with this pub, and uh, it sort of sprouted from there. And I've had, you know, I think it's fair to say I've had uh, varying successes in hospitality. It's a hard industry. The one mm. thing I did learn very, uh, one of my biggest lessons from my journey on uh, uh, entrepreneurship in hospitality is that regulated industries are where you want to be where there's a high barrier to entry, whether it be from a regulatory point of view, capital point of view, experience, if you think about GPs, doctors, dentists, uh, you know, uh, whether it be expensive franchises, McDonald's, uh, if we're talking about regulations, solicitors, uh, mm. uh, chartered accountants, financial advisors, mortgage, uh, you know, that where industries are regulated and there's a tougher barrier to entry, you generally see the margins are higher. Uh, they're a little bit easier to make work. Uh, they have their own nuances. You know, hospitality, um, it's an uh, industry where um, there's, you know, it's a lot of work and um, it's uh, at the lower end of the market. It's a model that works really well for owner occupiers who are willing to work long hours uh, and put a lot of effort in. And, you know, you can own a, 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 a pub owned by a brewery, which are the least profitable generally, uh, where you can walk in with five grand to get it. And you can still earn 150, 200 grand a year profit if you run it right and you do it well. You know, but but, 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 but I think that's a really interesting point there because I think you're quite modest about that when you say it's easier to work. I, my suspicion is that by concentrating on those heavier regulated businesses, which actually traditionally are not necessarily easy to make work, it's just whether you've got an attitude to do it. And obviously, you and Nicola have had that. I mean, the, the mortgage world has gone through a lot of change, isn't it? You know, um, yeah, being in that world, a regulated advisory world, is not easy anymore. And I suspect that. Did you have you found your hospitality that the impact of your working in hospitality and that consumer focus? Because I know, you know, well, I, I think I think with success to any business, if I'm being totally honest with you is about putting the customer at the heart of everything you do. Absolutely. And actually, that doesn't change across any business. It, you, mm. you know, about any business, you can pick anything, you know, from out of the, the – and I'm sure someone's going to watch this and come up with a really good example where you don't put the customer at the heart of what you do, like the prison service probably. But, uh, you know, the, the, in reality, um, you know, as long as you put the customer at the heart of what you do and you and you create value, you know, value yeah. is the key word. And, you know, value is different for different people. You know, and that's where a lot of businesses struggle or fail because if we think about, I don't know, if we think about hospitality as an example, you can't operate a Weatherspoons model versus a, an, an Ivy model. 
You know, it doesn't yeah. work because the yeah. customer different perceptions of value, different perceptions of quality. So I think you've got to, you know, what we've done on the businesses that we have done exceptionally well in hospitality, we've understood the market, we've understood what the customers want. Uh, we've had a vision on the product and the experience to what we want to do. And I guess the other thing is, as you go along, whether it be the mortgage business, whether it be hospitality, whether it be the other businesses we're, we're involved with, it's really important that you look at the journey that you go on and continue to evolve, listen to customer feedback and make sure that you stay relevant. Because if we think about, you know, I think about when I was a child, okay, it was like we would have a takeaway once every three months and it was really a huge, huge deal. You know, it was yeah. a big deal. We like almost had a family meeting about what we yeah, were going to yeah. have. You know, yeah. now our, in our household, more often than not, we probably have takeaway more than we eat. You know, some of the yeah, yeah. That. Yeah. We, you know, we're pretty – and, you know, owning a, a variety of different hospitality venues means that, you know, I, I got into a habit at one point where I was having two Sunday lunches on a Sunday. <laughs> so I try and – I would uh, – much predominantly I work across the mortgage business, but, you know, I would be out at the weekends and I will go to the venues and try the food and, yeah. you know, then, uh, there's some, something you call the curbside appeal. And so I would walk the same route that our customers do into the venue. I'd walk the grounds and have a look around and, you know, make sure that – what I knew was at least once a week someone was holding the management accountable for – experience we wanted and so and, you know, and did, did, did you sorry the means do you, do you yeah. think that attention to detail is what you and nicola have obviously made a ma massive success of the mortgage chart and, and, and you know mortgage buying a home is such a huge transaction for people such a big part of their lives you know life-changing stuff it, it, it has that attention to detail been something that you think has been led to your success in you know in both directions actually that, that uh, customer focus stuff yeah i guess first of all my attention to detail that there are people who have far better attention to detail i don't <laughs> want to sit and uh, claim to be a genius at all but i i think it's an important part i think the number one key to success is top end funnel you know it's the absolute truth whether that be customers walking through the door whether it be customers uh, inquiring or online asking for advice you know referral being made by customers that's the top end. number one is the top end funnel then if we talk about attention to detail that's where you retain the customers and get the referrals you yeah know, yeah hospitality, we want to look you know we you know one very small example of doing stuff differently was when i bought my first pub the thing that really me off was on a sunday i'd wake up and i'd want a sunday roast and no one you could book online locally no pub you know unless it was a chain so what you'd have to do is wait to 11 30 try to call them and they had a table lid in so from the start i introduced like integrated booking systems into all the businesses now and what that did was one made it super simple frictionless for a customer to be able to book and come and experience our service so we were able to take bookings quicker easier like but also we we had um you know more accurate data because as we took those bookings we had telephone numbers for sms air marketing emails mm. then actually what we did when uh, uh, and what we do is we actually have a centralized booking team so when you call a pub when you call a restaurant when you call one of my bars actually you're speaking to the same person you know yeah yeah that person is in a central location and they are trained to say oh do you have any allergies you know oh is it a special occasion oh it's your birthday fabulous whose birthday is it because when they arrive at the venue the management then know because when I started with the first venues, I'd say, okay, to the team in the venues who were very busy, who were very hardworking, who were overworked uh, in a lot yeah, of ways, yeah. I would say, make sure that you ask them about their allergies and their thing. And I would look at the booking system and be like, man with bald head and 12 people. And, you know, so there's no pre-order. We're not able to... <laughs> that sounds so, so simple stuff, but actually I, I get that entirely because because if you there is something about that when you arrive somewhere in there and someone sort of knows you and they know, oh, it's your birthday, you know, that, that, that familiarity changes the whole tone, doesn't it? And we all like to be made to feel special, you know. Yeah. Someone comes to me for, for, I get a lot of referrals personally for mortgages. I don't do mortgages. You want me to give you mortgage advice, you'd end up uh, with, with the worst product going but. In reality, if someone comes to me and they refer to me, I'll make sure that they're looked after. I'll, I'll get one of my assistants to track it through, make sure that the experience. And we like, you know, I think on it like the Starbucks experience. I go to my local Starbucks and they go in and the lady Lisa goes, oh, hi, Chris, you know, the usual, or I order on the app or whatever. And that makes me feel special. And that's what, yeah. that's what we do. Yeah. It's about experience. It's not about so going cool. to find just to eat food. Yeah. We go for the whole yeah. experience. And music. Music's the number one thing, actually, for me. <laughs> where music is the thing that I think a lot of the time is um, uh, makes or I think about Nando's, for example. So we got we got Nando's, uh, a couple of Nando's in the city where I live, and we've got like the knockoff Nando's, I'd say. 
<laughs> and I always love Nando's more. And it's the product metro I don't know. I think it is, but you know, actually the fit out's better, the music is better, you know, the yeah, yeah. of ordering on the app and stuff is better, and that's why I like and so you know, it's that whole experience that puts a, a business in the success together. Massively, yeah. And, and we'll, we'll talk about you. You're talking about touch on tech. I'm going to come back to that in a minute, if yeah. I may. Obviously, it's a yeah. subject close to my heart. But as is yeah, customer yeah. service, by the way. I mean, interestingly, you say about music. So there was a uh, Ian McKenna. I'm sure you know Ian, but Ian used yeah. to tell me uh, he'd gone through a process of getting the license to use "Always Look on the Bright Side of Life" as his whole music, which I thought was genius. I actually nicked the idea, but just to give Ian the credit. But we'll come back to tech in a minute. Um, on that added value thing, um, so so actually, although I'm, as I said before, I think we we've met and uh, our, our paths have, have sort of crossed uh, during, during history. Both been in the industry a long time. There was a connection, very close connection with someone that you know we we, we love our office, Carol, and her husband, yeah. her husband Ian. Yes, I think they worked with you in Vitality, well, actually. Yeah, they, they, yeah. 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 Crack, cracking people as well. And Carol said to pass her regards, obviously. But but yeah. the, the the reason I thought that was um, interesting was that obviously vitality on that added value piece i mean they that, for me they were the first people in the life insurance world and I, again i saw an interview with you around this subject where i think vitality apart from obviously you know your experiences when you were with them and and the takeaway you took from that it'd be good to get that had a profound effect on you at a personal level and that was a really interesting story to read about um but that i think they now did now that added value strategy didn't they they, they, yeah. they started to tilt things you know, that value proposition. Tell, tell us more about your history there and the connections well, and stuff, because I, I think that's you know, fascinating I, too. I, I, before I go to that, I guess I was uh, lucky enough uh, a couple of weeks ago to go to their executive summary of their, uh, their claims for 2023. And, you know, I think it's something along the lines of 800 million of additional value that they give out to customers uh, on top of paying stuff out. You know, and they, uh, but their products are also very different as well. So, without going into too much technical product knowledge of like critical illness, normally critical illness policy, you get cancer, it pays out, it's done. You know, most customers think that the policy will keep going, it doesn't. You know, Vitality, very new product, uh, serious illness, illness cover. You know, they're now, they've got one customer where it's now paid out four times for them, either partial mm. or in partial payments paying out. And so, you know, they are innovators in the industry of a product Amazing. that actually, generally, if you die, you die. If you get cancer, you get cancer, and that's that. So, but what they do very cleverly is they engage their customers to be more healthy. You know, so in my yeah. example of vitality, you know, I took a vitality policy, um, you know, well, probably about 10, 15 years ago. I took half a million pounds of life and critical illness cover, uh, and you know, I was a lot younger and uh, I wasn't particularly healthy, but a lot younger, and so the pricing wasn't crazy. And part of that journey was that you go afterwards, you can go from medical to just not for the underwriting, but just to make yourself more well and understand your health. And uh, through that journey, I uh, discovered I had type 2 diabetes. You know, mm. I was overweight. I'd started my career. Uh, I've always been in finance. I was a stockbroker in the city. You know, my job even today is a very social one. You know, I have lunches, dinners, I drink beer, I uh, you know, I can clear away a bottle of grey goose myself pretty much normally. <laughs> you, know, so I, you know, I have a very and uh, understanding that took me on a journey where you know I'm approximately nine stone, about fifty kilograms lighter than my heaviest. And by wow. doing that, my, wow. uh, the, the, the diabetes went completely. You know, and one of my challenges personally was I enjoyed flying planes, and I was unable to get the uh, the, the medical signed off for the Civil Aviation Authority to be able to fly solo because my blood sugar was uncontrolled. And so my journey was, you know, I lost weight. Um, I uh, lived a, you know, healthier lifestyle. If I sit here and I tell you I lead a healthy lifestyle, I'm a liar. You know, someone pulled out a, a video that I, I made a couple of years ago where I said, I don't drink anymore. And I'd gone through a period of about three months of not drinking. And they said, that's a lie. And I said, <laughs> <laughs> you know, that, that was true at the time, should we say. And so, you know, but that, Everything that, in moderation. Everything in moderation. <laughs> You know, but it changed my life because actually I'd had um, uh, from a very young age uh, symptoms like tremors in my hands and I've been to see consultants, but no one had pinpointed that, you know. And actually after my diagnosis, my dad got diagnosed and my auntie and it became a bit of a, you know, a, 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 an interesting journey there. But from a life insurance point of view, what a clever idea because I would have died. My doctor himself told me I would die at least 10 years younger than I will now if I hadn't changed my lifestyle. And if you've got to pay out half a million pounds to me, you know, it's a good idea. All bar getting like 
dragging me in a headlock down to David Lloyd and strapping me to the treadmill. You know, it's a good it's, way of... It is brilliant, though. It's, it's just, I, I love I love that lateral thinking. Obviously, this is something that I think, you know, entrepreneurially, you, you've obviously demonstrated by using experiences from that side of your life over there. I think that's super. And I think, personally, that on the, the vitality thing, you know, going beyond the brand, a, a, a close friend of mine, I remember talking about life, and I don't know why they ever got into the subject, but he said, oh... Yeah, my life insurance policy is amazing. And so tell me more about it. And I, the second he said it, I, because of, you know, I've been involved in that, I knew, I knew what he was going to say. He said, let me give you an example. He said, my wife got a fantastic discount on this carbon bike. My son goes to the cinema once a week, you know. And I'm, I'm saying, but what value, what, what about the life coverage? He, he couldn't actually tell me about the policy, but there was no question it was going nowhere because of those added value. Brilliant. And, and, and vitality, a little bit like technology. When I look, you know, and, and I know we'll get onto this, but when I worked for a technology business in the Middle East, you know, I worked in an incubation hub for new tech ideas. And the thing that I always looked at was, you know, how you reach the customers to start with and then how you get them to engage. And Vitality's biggest challenge, they've got a great product. They, they have two challenges. Uh, the first one is the advisors who make the recommendations understanding how great the product is, you know. And then the second thing is getting customers to engage. And, you know, it's a little bit of, of that uh, once customers engage with it, that they're, they're sold. Uh-huh. And there's another thing that life insurance, a little bit like if we flip to something like Sky, for example, Sky's biggest problem is getting customers to be loyal and to use it and to engage and keep it. Okay. So that's the same with life insurance. You know, what happens is people go five years down the line, they forget why it is, you know, we go through a bit of a cost of living crisis, maybe they lose their job. They don't cancel Sky, they don't cancel Netflix first, they cancel their life cover. And actually, they paid all these premiums. And in reality, you know, bar you know the horrible things that happen in life generally you're going to claim later in the policy rather than at the beginning of it generally speaking not always of course you know we see mm. we probably have about 10 to 15 death claims across our financial services business on insurances a year so you know we see 20 i saw a couple of years ago 28 year 28 year old female her husband uh you know was a roofer 34 and he had a heart attack whilst he was on the roof. Oh that didn't, didn't, mm. What building was falling off the roof? You mm. know, and it's stuff like you see stuff like that, and you think, and that's where you know when I talk to yeah, my team, yeah, and that's where w- when I talk to my teams, I say to them, look, I don't want you to hard sell customers anything, but it's our job to make people every everyone know their options, and so that's totally, uh, yeah. You know, th- those Let, of things are really. Let's head down that technology track. I'm not going to stay yeah. there too long because I yeah. know. And so tell tell me more about your your um, that experience of you in the Far East. I know they've been. You know, yeah, I think you're out in Dubai more recently as well, probably for other reasons. But yeah, please, please yeah, so, more about that. Know, the, the reality was, you know, I've always been, you know, I'm I'm lucky when I started this, and I'm starting to get to the point where, unfortunately, this isn't applicable anymore. But when I started the mortgage business at 21, you know, most of my competitors were middle to later age white males, generally speaking. You know, that was it. And then, you know, they had great marketing ideas about the yellow pages and Thompson Local and this and that and you know, and, and, and that was it. And, you know, it was and, uh, and chasing after estate agents. And, you know, I was always interested in Facebook marketing. You know, we were very early innovators with Facebook marketing back in 2014. You know, we use a lot of SEO now. We've just started using a lot of email outreach and things to, to reach our target audience. So I've always been really interested. And back in 2018, I was approached by, uh, you know, a billion dollar tech business in the Middle East, uh, bought a mortgage business. It wasn't doing particularly well. It was a bit stinky. And, um, you know, and they said, oh, will you come and run it? And so the deal got done and I started working at running this business in, in the Middle East. And it was, you know, it was night and day to the UK. We, before we get onto technology, I guess the first thing was there was no regulation. So, you know, you went in, none of the mortgage advisors were qualified. You know, the first week it was like the marketing material, you know, the rate was from one product, you know, the the, the the standard variable was from another the fees are from another product and they put it all together not and not the company that i work for by the way but our competition we put it all together to make it look like one product and and you know i remember uh sitting uh so the, the you know the uk mortgage market's pretty good because it self regulates to a certain extent on commissions and price bias so actually most mortgage lenders will pay we have 110 lenders across the mortgage business roughly they pretty much will pay us the same money so there isn't what we would call a price bias. Mm. And if I have, I'm going, oh, well, I get paid double from HSBC what I do from that West, which mm. creates good behaviors, good outcomes. And the industry does that generally, although there is regulation there, generally does it itself because, you know, they know that that's the right thing for customer outcomes. Yeah, yeah. You know, there, I would, uh, I was, I was, when I went in, the top lender that was recommended 
uh, by the company was actually had the fifth best product. And when I said, oh, why do we recommend this? And they said, oh, well, the, the players double the money. And I, right. and so I remember I was sat around with a load of Emiratis from, you know, the, the nation's main bank. And, you know, you do have to be a little bit, it's not exactly like it. You have to be a little bit more tactical. But they said, oh, you know, you, you stopped sending us business. Why is that? And I'm just like, because, you know, your product is the bottom line. And they're like, well, that's- <laughs> don't say that so, are you good? <laughs> no, well, and that's it. And that's, uh, you know, you can start to see how you start to ruffle some feathers. Mm. Uh, so, uh, yeah, you know, and I, and I said, look, I'm not, there's, and they're like, but we pay you double what everyone else does. And I said, well, you know, respectfully, that doesn't bother me. You know, mm-hmm. because actually good customer outcomes is what's going to drive success in any business. Yeah. And taking that position helped me and, you know, everyone around me, uh, my senior management team thought I was actually mental. You know, they thought I was actually crazy because I come into this business and it had issues with, you know, racism, sexism, bullying, all of this, you know, and I and, and I stood up there on the first day and I said, you know, if I'm not going to bully anyone, no one here is going to bully any, anyone. You know, that is it. This is done. You know, and I and I said, like, I'll treat you all equally. I'm not listening to what anyone says, but mark my words, if you mark your cards, you're gone. And so, you know, we started afresh, we moved forward. And um, actually what I was able to do was go to other banks. I met a very good CEO of a, 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 a large bank uh, from, U- he was a European, he ran a, a Middle Eastern bank. And, you know, I said to him, look, you're going to have to believe in me because I can, I can 10x what we're putting to you um, and, uh, uh, but I need the product to be a lot better and I need you to pay me double the amount. And he was like, he looked at me like I was crazy, which probably I was. There was probably a little bit of inexperienced optimism there, isn't that, you know, but, you know, he did it and we and we did it. And, you know, yeah. I think we went from, you know, we essentially within six months had three times our actual overall business, um, which was fairly significant. Um, and we had used, you know, we were lucky that we're part of a big tech business, you know, the equivalent of right move, we were able to, you know, uh, we we were the fastest moving team in the business at the time. You know, I yeah. was saying to my teams, uh, because it was a typical tech thing, the world's changed a little bit now that we need to make money in tech. But it was a typical tech business where they had a pool table and, a, you know, an Xbox <laughs> and this. And I said to my whole engineering team at the time, I said, if I see you sat at any of those Xboxes at any point, we're going to have a problem. And I was like, you can play Xbox, <laughs> but when you're working, you're working for me. And I had a really good tech lead. Uh, who, who a Romanian guy called Stamit, and he was, you know, very business savvy. You know, he understood it. He actually said to me, "Oh, you should invest in, in a company uh, called uh, it's called Zoom. You know, they're great." You know, and and I was like, "Oh, cool." We had Zoom rooms before. You know, all of this, uh, all, all totally. of it about all COVID. Yeah. And, you know, and actually, we whereas the other teams would send people to you know Egypt and then send them to you know all Lebanon and all the countries that we worked in we didn't send anyone anywhere we did everything via Zoom because we didn't need to spend yeah, yeah. Day traveling and so you know head of the, but, head, of the head of the curve on that on that piece then like by, by a mile sounds like yeah, yeah and, and but it, working for a tech business is very different in financial yeah. service because you yeah, get yeah. attitude of not this is how we do it and the challenge in the UK that we have a little bit okay is that lenders have legacy systems there's a lot of fragmentation. They all do it differently. And they're starting to really make some amazing progress. Yeah. That progress is very challenging for them and very expensive. You know, whereas when you have, um, you know, when you work for a tech business, you say, how, what, what, what's right for the customer? How do we drive this forward? What's the experience? Yeah, yeah. yeah. A lot of learnings that you take from e-commerce, you know, and a lot of digital and online journeys and apply those and make some real, real progress. So, and never you have. Have you been able to apply that? I mean, is technology a big part of the the mortgage chart these days? I'm, I'm assuming when, when you're sourcing, you know, you mentioned that number of lenders, you've got to have access to the, to all that kit. So we, we uh, I think we're pretty tech savvy. You know, we yeah. when it comes to lead generation, we have over a hundred customers every day contact us. Our cost to acquire the customers very very low. You know, our competition probably pay between twenty five and thirty percent a lot of them to acquire new customers, whether that be PPC or paying estate agents. You know, our cost to acquire customers less than five percent across yeah. the board with our market. Amazing. You know, but that takes a lot of investment, a lot of you know, it, I guess if we take a step back to where we started, we talked about hospitality and financial services. One of the biggest differences is if you come to, you know, my premium restaurant in the marina in Southampton and you have a lovely meal with your family today. That money is in my bank account tomorrow. Mm. Okay. If I speak to you today or one of my team speaks to you about a mortgage today for the first time, I probably don't see that money for nine months. Mm. Okay. 
So the mortgage business is very capital intensive. You know, I've just employed another four new mortgage advisors this week. Okay, I can quite comfortably say that probably will eat out somewhere between a hundred and hundred and fifty grand of cash flow. Probably, yeah. Like yeah. That. And that's that's a lot of money for small. We're an SME. We're not. I still own the business. You know, mm. it's, we're backed by a VC. It's not like we have investors. So, you know, the difference, I guess, with the mortgage business is you need to, and 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 it links into sort of. The, the marketing approach that we take you just need to have a, a little bit of confidence in yourself yeah you know, back yourself with it and 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 really you know you you do have to sort of have have you know a little bit of balls i guess sometimes yeah yeah I've just comes through not, not only the bad year that we had with list trust and the economy which i'm not blaming on her uh, but you know it appeared to be uh triggered by some actions there and, yeah, yeah. You know, that, that that had a fairly significant impact on our cash flow of hundreds and hundreds of thousands of pounds, you know, coupled with I've just gone for a huge regulatory change, which mm. probably disrupts my cash flow by half a million pounds. So actually, you need to be yeah. relatively confident. You either need to be confident or stupid. And I've seen that with your approach sometimes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, a little bit. Of, mix of madness helps in there too. But it sounds like there's plenty of both. Um, just, just on that, I mean, you know, obviously that whole piece about looking after people absolutely resonates. I mean, you know, we, we live and breathe around that ourselves, you know, because I just think it's a... Uh, it, it's a skill that's to a certain extent been lost. And I don't understand why, to be honest with you. It doesn't feel like it's complicated. But, but, but you know, you obviously, you know, that, that's a big focus for you. It, I, I know when I, when I was looking into things a bit, and I know you mentioned that, that well, I'd seen that there was a mention of your connection with the armed services. And in fact, I think you, you, you're in this, are you still in the specials? That's not the group, by the way, isn't there? Yeah, is that still that's, that's, part of um, your life? Yeah. So, you know, I, I, I was a special constable for Hampshire Police for, I don't know, four or five years, and uh, yeah. I still an awful lot of friends there, uh, you know, and up until a couple of years ago, we dealt with two of the police federations, which are like the unions for the police, you know, we've scaled that out relatively, you know, there was a, there's been a couple of, you know, should we say stars aligning, which have meant that there's been a bit of a perfect storm for us to uh, land grab there, you know, and make some progress. So we've gone from Maybe. two federations and there's 48 in the UK to now being the preferred mortgage broker for 23 of them. Wow. Uh, you know, we could take more and make more progress. You know, our reputation within that market is very, very strong. You know, our, our customer outcomes, you know, we do a lot of work. We've just started working with the main credit union for the police as well, dealing with customers that they can't help. Um, you know, and 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 um, and so that's a good element of business. It's not the most profitable, but they are some of the most loyal. Um, yeah. So and and business is really in the mortgage business specifically. I I learned very early on looking to, to, from the outside into people's businesses, and this would be my tip for anyone who's starting out: just look at who does it best. You know, look and listen. And actually, I was cheeky enough that I went around and spoke to people. I could go and speak to my competition and think, "Yeah, well, that's a good idea. I'll do that. Oh, that's a good idea." You know, and had the respect to do that. And um, you know, it, it, it's in uh, what. I guess I learned early on that you don't want all your eggs in one basket when you come to lead sources. You know, yeah, yeah. In a volatile, you know, if you do think there is volatility in our sector for a top end funnel, you know, when Lids Trust did announce a budget and for whatever reason, which uh, my personal opinion is because of the budget, but if you, if you have a different pol political view, I agree with it as well, uh, 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 is that actually customers stop calling about mortgages. And so you need to have a real good blend. So police did account for a 1.60% of our business back in 2015 when we were a lot smaller because um, we had we have a page of about 20,000 people on Facebook. Facebook marketing stopped working. We pivoted away. We did other stuff, you know, and it dropped about 5%. I think probably uh, within the next 12 months, it will account for about 25% of the business. But we also work with a brand called Airline Mortgage Shop where we work with British Airways, Virgin Atlantic, a lot of the... Uh, big, uh, 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 aviation companies because yeah amazing you know, that's very yeah. flattering i mean you know that's that's that was a that's a very flattering situation isn't it there's a there's a reason why those businesses want to deal with you so you've obviously done done a lot right there to to to, to get them focused on and you so that's fantastic i would definitely say a lot of it's done not by me by the way i come on podcasts and i go around and talk and i, <laughs> and I claim all these stories but it's nicholas Nick, 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 she's doing all yeah, that running around in there <laughs> we have in the admins that we have in the market you know there's a huge team behind us uh, you know, it's the other thing have people that are better at everything than yourself absolutely but, but that is, having a, 
you know, they, they do a lot of really great things. And, and you know, it's uh, and sometimes in my over enthusiasm to uh, talk about the business, I forget to uh, credit them with most of the success. No, 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 no. I think you've listened. I think you've you've, you've said that in, you know um, as part of weaving through this conversation. And I totally agree. I mean, the team, your team is everything. Isn't it? The people in your team are everything. So, um, uh, listen, we could. Uh, I, I just got amazing there with the time flies. I've got a couple of things I wanted to get in and make sure I get in. So, so on, on on the eve of England, you know, this is being filmed. I know we're going to be after that, so we're going to know the result by by the end of the evening. But um uh, on the eve of the is it quarter final tonight netherlands versus the uk I, I, what when i when i um and I, I, forgive me at the beginning I, I, your 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 surname is actually drummed into my head because i've been looking up a bit about uh shoe traps and your well, surname because I, I was intrigued I, I can already <laughs> answer your question before you ask it which is either way tonight i win <laughs> so listen it's a, it's a strange one because obviously with the surname of holland you could be you know you'd be forgiven for thinking up oh, yeah i'm yeah. uk i mean that's part of the reason i wore the t-shirt today because you know you, the uk for me but but um uh, when i looked up shoe trucks actually i think the the netherlands you know actually i looked my, my own surname up as well because i thought but I'm, I'm mine's as common as much chris i mean there are five million occurrences of my surname in the uk in, in around the world for yours there yeah. are 300 and where are we 314. So, firstly, you, you know, you're much more unique, you know, and uh, yeah, there we go. But the- you can, it's easy to be remembered, but also, uh, if you get anything wrong, it's easy to be remembered. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, but, but there's a Netherlands connection there, apparently. 307 incidents in the Netherlands. I couldn't find out what the what your surname actually meant, but I'll, I'll come back to that one. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, <laughs> I just thought I, it was interesting. I can tell you, like, uh, my surname actually is from a German town. Uh, oh. Uh, so, uh, and so uh, my, my that's where the, the, the name originates from. And then uh, my dad's side of the family lived in the north uh, side of Holland. I have actually a relatively famous cousin who's a DJ um, uh, or who was a DJ when I was growing up. He was the one that, you know, stole the good email addresses, should we say. Um, <laughs> but, you know, that as far as I'm aware, you know, the name's very rare in Holland as well. There's only one, you know, my father brought the surname to the UK, so we're the only family. So, it's, as I say, it's great for, uh, you know, and I, I, you can't tell from this, but I'm six foot seven as well. So, you know, there's lots of distinct <laughs> reasons this why. Thing, yeah, it. absolutely. Uh, so good for when you go out and talk, but also, uh, you know, uh, when I'm stood in a bar or in an event at six foot yeah, seven. You're going to be... You're going to be seen. You're going to be seen. Brilliant. And listen, this has been absolutely fascinating for me. It's so nice to meet you. I'm really, really thank. Thanks so much for your time. I've got to ask you this one last question. I always like to ask people this, and yeah, I've got. To, you probably have to try and narrow it because you've, you've had a lot of experience there. But I always like to ask the guests on this: if you could give your younger self one, maybe two, because you, you you know you're you, you come from a, a, a different background, really. So, one or two pieces of advice. Can you think what those would be? Yeah, like, and it would be to people that I speak to all the time as well. Just do it, you know, because especially with first businesses for people, they procrastinate and they think, oh, what if, what if, what if? And you know what? It's like everything. Don't worry. You know, when you get to that bridge, you're going to sort it. You know, it's uh, it's one of those things. Tomorrow <laughs> might never happen. So, you know, my first uh, bit of advice, you know, people say to me, oh, you know, you buy these companies, you sell these companies, you do it. And it's the first one, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's uh, my advice would always be, you know, just do it, give it a try, you know, just take mm. the action, take that first step because that's the hardest thing. You know, I had an uncle who uh, ended up being CEO of a bank in Holland, but actually he, at one point he was um, uh, 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 in charge of uh, an insight, a door to door encyclopedia sales company. who was the sales <laughs> director or finance director. Right. And he said, the hardest, and this is true of any salesperson, okay, the hardest door for his salespeople were their own front door. And that's the same whether you're picking up a phone to sell to people, whatever you're doing, that's the truth. So, you know, that would be my my, uh, yeah. my first bit. You're going to. I guess the second bit of advice is don't worry if it doesn't work. You know, like I, you know, I have, I, we talked about hospitality and I didn't profess in, in there to say everything's a success. You know, not everything works, but I'd rather try something and it not work and do it in the right way, you know, and get it right for people. But try something in it, not work, then never try anything at all. I I, I hope that I've still got amazing things to come. Uh, I'm only a little bit on the journey, I would say. But, you know, I, I think it's about just, you know, better to try sure. something than never try at all. Absolutely. Superb. Listen, thanks so much for your time. Chris Shoe Trups, Shoe Trups, get that absolutely right on the end there, Shoe Trups. 
thank you so much for joining us and uh, hope everyone enjoys this as much as I did. Thank you.